Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee once more that Thou hast brought us together. We are conscious that our times are in Thy hands, that our very breath is in Thy hands. So we thank Thee, O Lord, for Thy goodness and Thy mercy and Thy kindness to us, and for health and strength, and all that Thou dost give us so freely. But above all, we thank Thee that Thou hast given us this new life, which has created within us new interests, a new outlook, and new desires. And so we thank Thee that we have this interest in Thy Word and in Thy truth, and that our concern is to understand it, that we may help others and make it known to them, and so minister to Thy glory and to Thy praise. We confess, O Lord, before Thee that we are aware that we are unprofitable servants at our very best, but we do desire to be better. And we thank Thee that Thou hast provided for us this instruction so that we have no need merely to draw on our own thinking and suppositions and ideas or be guided even by the time in which we live, but that we have these great principles so clearly laid down in Thy Word. We pray Thee, therefore, that we may be given that ready mind, that quickened mind, which Thy Spirit alone can give us, in order that we may be able to understand and able to submit and willing to submit to thy way, that there be no contradiction between our message and our method. O oh Lord, go on then, we pray thee, to instruct us and to guide us and to lead us on, and unto thee shall we give all the praise. Pardon us our every sin as we ask these mercies, pleading nothing but the name and the merit of thy dear Son, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> Well, you remember that uh, yesterday we were considering some of the things that we have to be careful about and some things that we have to avoid, things in the preacher, things in the sermon, and things in the actual preaching. And we ended by saying that what is desirable always is that we forget ourselves and be so taken up with the work that we have no time even to think of anything else and certainly no desire to do so. But now, <clears throat> this uh, again leads on to another question. I'm trying to be practical, and trying to be contemporary particularly. Uh, so I must raise with you the question of whether we should do anything to condition the meeting and to condition the people uh, for the reception of our message. Um, and you are familiar, of course, with uh, what I have in mind. The question of music comes in here. After all, the preacher is the man who's in charge of, uh, of all these things, and it is within his province, I argue, to control this. Uh, he may find this very difficult at the present time. But uh, this question does arise, and I've known many ministers and preachers in great trouble over this. The question of choirs and singing of anthems and perhaps quartets within the choirs are extracted from them or even sometimes specially called in and paid and then soloists and so on, organ voluntaries and then coming down to a cruder type, endless chorus singing and then ending with, well, I must be careful, uh, song leaders, song leaders, a man whose special function it is to conduct uh, the singing and to do what he can to put the people into the right mood and condition for the reception of the message. Now, how do we evaluate all this? What's our attitude towards this? Well, my first comment would be, that here again we have something exactly the same as uh, some of the things we were considering yesterday afternoon. This all, of course, is again just a hangover from Victorianism. I threaten sometimes to write a book on the 19th century. I think it was the devastating century. The sooner we forget the 19th century, the better, and go back to the 18th. 
and a bit further back even up to the 17th if you like. But the 19th century was a terrible century as I see things from our standpoint particularly. It was then this fatal turn took place in so many respects as we've been seeing as we've gone along. And this was, of course, very definitely one of them. All this was introduced then. Very often they didn't even have an organ before that. Some of the fathers were opposed to organs. I think they had no case in scripture, but uh, they were. And uh, they were certainly, many of them, opposed to singing anything but psalms. They would only sing hymns and uh, choruses. I think might very well have given many of them an attack of apoplexy. Uh, but, uh, and uh, song leaders and so on. All this was unthinkable to them. It, it certainly, uh, these innovations came in in the last century, and it was a part of this respectability, uh, this pseudo-intellectualism and respectability to which I was referring yesterday. But uh, more particularly with these matters, I think there is a, a very real danger often of a kind of organist tyranny. You see, the organist is in a position to control the praise so much. He, with this powerful instrument, can control the, uh, the, the rate at which you sing, and that can greatly affect a hymn. It can change the character of the praise and of a hymn completely, if he takes it too quickly or if he takes it too slowly. And after all, here he is, he is in charge of this. And uh, many a man has uh, had great trouble in his ministry with a difficult organist, with a man who sometimes is more interested in music than in truth. They often are, so that one should be very careful in appointing an organist to make sure that he is a Christian man, and that he's a believer in the truth. And if you will have choirs, insist upon the same with every member of the choir. Uh, we don't go primarily for the vice, but uh, primarily for the Christian character, and the love of the truth, and the delight in singing it. So you can get this organist tyranny, and you can get choir tyranny. Uh, I don't know whether this has been true of your country, but there was an expression uh, used in my home country, Wales. I don't know that I've heard it put like this exactly in English, but it was quite a, uh, a phrase, a well-known phrase. It wasn't put so much in terms of choirs there even, but it was known as the devil of singing. Uh, what they meant by that was that this question of singing caused more divisions in churches than practically anything else whatsoever. And it has been, of course, a very frequent source of trouble, I know, in your country as well as in others. Well, therefore, uh, this thing has got to be faced, and then there is the whole question of the entertainment element coming in. <coughs> that people come to listen to the music and so on. Now, I think we can lay it down as a fairly general rule that uh, the greater the amount of attention that has been paid to this aspect of worship, namely the, the type of building and the ceremonial and the singing and the music, the greater the emphasis on that, generally speaking, uh, the less spirituality have you had a lower spiritual temperature and spiritual understanding and desire. But I would go further than this and ask the question, and, and I feel it's time we all began to ask this question. As I said yesterday in another connection, we've got to break in to these bad habits that have come into our churches, which have become a tyranny, this set form. And as I say, they are willing for you to play about with the truth, but you mustn't play about with the service. This rigid set form, I think we've got to break into it, and particularly in this matter now. And it's time we ask the question, why is any of this necessary? What part does it have at all? Let's ask this question once more. We know why it was started last century, so let's ask this question, why any of it? And surely we must come to this conclusion that the ideal is a people, a congregation, singing the praises of God together. And the only use of an organ is to accompany that, nothing else. 
It's an accompaniment. It doesn't dictate, and it mustn't be allowed to. It must be subservient. And uh, I would go so far as to say that the preacher should choose the tunes as well as the hymns. Because sometimes uh, there can be a contradiction there. A man may put on a tune to a hymn which virtually contradicts the message of the hymn. So the preacher has the right to be in charge of these matters. And he mustn't allow this to go out of his hands. Well, you may not come as far as that with me, but um, and abolish choirs and so on. But uh, I hope you do come to the point of saying that the ideal is that all the people should be lifting up their voices and rejoicing as they do so. I'm sure you will agree that when I say that deliberate attempts at conditioning the people are surely thoroughly bad. Uh, I, I'm going to deal with this in, the, in my next section. But I'll just put it like this now, that this attempt to condition the people, to soften them, as it were, is surely something that uh, militates against the true preaching of the gospel. And uh, this is not a mere idle talk, because I remember once being in a very famous religious conference in this country of yours, a few years back, and I found that uh, this is what happened in every single meeting. When other speakers spoke and when I spoke, you were asked to be on the platform at a given time, and then there was literally 40 minutes of singing conducted by the song leader. There was no reading of the scripture, the briefest possible prayer, and then you were put on, as it were. Well, uh, this is what I mean, you see, by this entertainment element. I, I'm, I haven't troubled to tell you about the form the singing took. I remember there was... Uh, an organ solo, a xylophone solo, and there was a band of colored people, I remember the name even, the Eureka Jubilee Singers, who more or less acted what they were singing, and so on, this for 40 minutes. Well, uh, I found it very difficult to preach after that, uh, and found my messages being modified as I went on to deal with the situation by which I was confronted. <laughs> This, you see, is, is, is the danger that is involved in all this. And this is why we have to be so careful. So I would say, as a general rule, keep the music in its place. Keep it in its place. It's the handmaiden, the servant. And it must not be allowed to dominate and to control in any sense. And then I mentioned another thing that uh, sounds trivial, and yet uh, some people have paid great attention to this as to whether you should manipulate the lights in the building in which you're preaching. <coughs> Some of them would even, and do have, different colored lights. And as the preaching goes on, the sermon goes on, lights are gradually put out, until at the end, above the preacher, in so the case I'm thinking of, uh, there was nothing at the end, no light, except an illuminated red cross. You see, this is all psychological conditioning. And it's been justified in terms of uh, making it easier for people to believe and to accept the truth. Well, I think we can leave it at that and say that we don't approve of this kind of procedure, that it's alien to the whole atmosphere in which we meet together to worship God and to consider his truth to us. But this leads on quite naturally to another question which is a, a bigger one. And that is the whole question now of whether at the end of this sermon which the preacher has preached in the ways we've been considering, the question now arises, should he appeal for decisions there and then? There are many terms for this, as you know, called an altar call sometimes, sometimes called a penitent form, anxious seat. These are the various terms applied to it. Now, this uh, is a subject, uh, as I say, that uh, has gained considerable prominence, especially at the present time. And uh, therefore it's my obvious duty to, to deal with this for you, because it is a decision that rests with the preacher. He's the man who decides this and controls this. And uh, I, I've often had to face this problem. I've had people who come to me 
at the close of a service and have chided me and have reprimanded me because I hadn't made an appeal. They felt that some of them would go so far as to say that I'd been guilty of sin, that there was a, an opportunity created by my own preaching, and I didn't take it. They said, I'm quite sure that if you'd only made the appeal, you'd have had a great response, that kind of argument. I've had to meet this many, many, many times. Then, uh, in addition to that, I have been told by a number of ministers uh, within the last years that they have been told at the end of a service that they hadn't preached the gospel simply because they hadn't made an appeal. And uh, this uh, had happened in a morning service uh, as well as an evening service. I mean, by that, to use your uh, terminology and to use your method, this had happened to them not in evangelistic services only, but also in other services which were plainly not meant to have a primary evangelistic uh, intent. But they were charged with uh, not having preached the gospel. And indeed, during my last visit to this country two years ago, I met three men, three ministers, who had virtually been given a call to minister in certain churches, and were on the verge of accepting, when someone suddenly asked the question, did they give this altar call at the end of every sermon? And because these three particular men said that they didn't, they didn't receive the call. The decision was reversed. So you see, it has become a very acute problem. And the reason for this, I think, is, is obvious. It's because of certain things that have been happening uh, since the end of the last war. So it is a very urgent problem. Now, let's uh, be clear again about the history of this, because I think it's helpful to approach it historically. And uh, I assume that you um, are aware of the fact that all this, again, only came in in the last century. It came in fairly early in the century, earlier than the other things I've been talking about, but it came in, really, with Charles G. Finney. Uh, he was the man who introduced this anxious seat. He was the man who emphasized this uh, calling upon people to take an, a decision there and then. It was an essential part of his whole method, and it led to great controversy at the time. And uh, I, I think it's uh, a most important controversy and uh, a very interesting and fascinating one. And I commend to you to do some reading about this. Uh, the difference between a man of the name of Nettleton, uh, if I remember rightly, Azahel Nettleton, and Finney. Uh, Nettleton was a man who was greatly used in uh, preaching services, and he would travel. He'd be invited to churches uh, to preach, and he would. Uh, and he never made this call at all, but he was a man greatly used, and large numbers of people were converted under his ministry. He was a, a Calvinist, and he put his beliefs into practice in this matter. But then there came Finney, and there was this rivalry, as it were, between the two men, from not in person, but the two views, and many men were in great difficulties about this. And uh, you'll find it very fascinating if you read the the autobiography of Lyman Beecher in this connection, who started off as a great bosom friend of Nettleton, but eventually went on to the side of Finney, and subsequently was even put on trial for his orthodoxy by the Presbyterian Church. Well, now, the history, then, is very interesting, but that's how it came in, and I feel this is all very important. It is not accidental that it came in with Finney, because ultimately this is a whole matter of theology. It, it, the thing that determines one's view of this, I think, is ultimately purely theological. Well now, perhaps the best way in which uh, I can stimulate your thought and give some little help in this matter is just to make the blunt statement that I have not done this, uh, as I've indicated to you. And so let me give you some reasons why I have not done this. It's very difficult to get these into any exact uh, systematic order, but I think that more or less they would come in my thinking at any rate in this kind of order. The first is 
that uh, it is wrong, surely, to put direct pressure on the will. Um, let me expand that. Man uh, consists uh, of uh, his mind, his affections, and his will. And my contention is that you shouldn't put direct pressure on the will, that the will should always be approached through the mind, the intellect, and then the affections, and that the will is determined by the other two. And if you want a scriptural warrant for that, I would refer you to the epistle to the Romans, chapter 6 and verse 17, where the apostle puts it like this. God be thanked, God be thanked he says, that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of sound doctrine that was delivered unto you. Now, you see the order. They have obeyed, yes, but how? From the heart. What, what was it that made them do this? What was it that moved their hearts? It was this form of sound teaching that had been delivered to them. The message is truth. It's addressed primarily to the mind. And as the mind uh, grasps it and understands it, it moves the affections. And in turn, the will is moved in this way. So the, the obedience is the outcome. In other words, the obedience is not something direct. It is the result of something else. To me, this is a crucial point. Now, let me show you uh, the importance of this idea. You remember that the other afternoon I was venturing to suggest that even the great Whitfield at times fell into the error of making a direct attack upon the emotions or the imagination. And we reprobated any man who deliberately does that. Well, this is exactly the same principle. As it is wrong to, to make a direct attack upon the emotions, so it is equally wrong to make a direct attack upon the will. We are to present the truth. And clearly, this is something first and foremost to the mind. And the moment we depart from this order and this rule and make these direct approaches on the other two elements, we are asking for trouble and we are likely to get it. Well then, uh, secondly, I would put it like this, that too much pressure on the will, there is an inevitable amount of this in all preaching, but I say too much pressure or too direct a pressure is dangerous. Because in the end, you see, you arrive at this position that what has determined the obedience of the man who comes forward is not so much the truth itself as perhaps the personality of the evangelist or uh, some vague general fear or some kind of psychological influence. This is where we link up, you see, with the music. We can become drunk on music. No question about this at all. Music can have that effect, that it uh, creates uh, an emotional state in which the mind is no longer acting as it should and no longer discriminating. Uh, I've known people many times sort of sing themselves into a state of intoxication without realizing uh, what they were doing. And so, you see, you arrive at this position that the effect produced is not produced by the truth, but it is produced by one or other of these factors. Now, I came across a very notable illustration of this very point a few years back. And this is what it was. It had publicity in the press, so I'm not uh, divulging anything secret at all. It, I read it myself in the press. There was a certain evangelist in Great Britain, a well-known evangelist. He was asked if he would conduct uh, a program which we have every Sunday night on the radio called Half Hour Hymn Singing. It's something that goes on every Sunday night from half past eight to nine. And different churches are asked to do this, and they do it. Well, on this occasion, this well-known evangelist was asked if he would do it, and he said he would, and he jumped at the opportunity and he took the Albert Hall in London, the largest hall in London, seating about 7,000 people. 
he was going to have his half-hour hymn singing there. And everything was planned months ahead of time. But about a uh, week or so before, this program was actually due to take place and to be broadcast. Uh, Dr. Billy Graham arrived in London, and on hearing this, the British evangelist invited him to preach before this half-hour hymn singing. And so he did. The service now started at 7.30 instead of 8.30. Indeed, I suppose they would have done that in any case. However, the point was that uh, Graham preached in this meeting and was told that he'd got to stop, you see, before 8.30 because at that time they would be coming on the air and there's a half an hour hymn singing. And he did this. He preached and finished in time. And then immediately he finished. They were on the air and they had half an hour hymn singing. Then after that, he made his altar call, gave his invitation to people to come forward. Well, now, this was the interesting thing. He was interviewed by the press the next day, and uh, they asked him, uh, was he satisfied with the appeal, with the result of his appeal on Sunday night in the Albert Hall? And he said at once that he wasn't, that he was disappointed. The number was so much smaller than he'd been accustomed to in London as well as in other places. And then he was asked the obvious question by one of these journalists. To what, then, did he attribute the fact that the response was so comparatively small on this occasion. And without any hesitation, he answered, he said it was quite simple, that unfortunately this half hour of hymn singing had come in between the end of his sermon and the giving of the appeal. And he said that was the explanation. If only he'd been allowed to give his appeal immediately, the result would have been altogether greater. Now, you see what I'm illustrating. Isn't that proof in and of itself that what produces the results is clearly not the truth or the work of the Spirit. Because here was a man admitting himself that the results could not even stand up to half an hour's hymn singing. That half an hour's hymn singing can do away with the effect, whatever it was. And so the result becomes disappointing. I'm suggesting that here is a great illustration of the fact that the pressure on the will leads you to this result, that it isn't the truth that is doing it, but it is something else. So I go on to this uh, next proposition. My third argument is this one, that the preaching of the word and the call for decision should not be separated in our thinking. Now, I want to expand what I mean here. You know that great uh, Protestant principle, which came in in the 16th century, <clears throat> so rightly and so scripturally, that the sacraments should never be separated from the Word. The Roman Catholics had been guilty of that. They'd been doing that. And Protestantism objects to this. And it says that you shouldn't administer the sacraments without the preaching of the Word. They mustn't be isolated. They mustn't be regarded as things in and of themselves. Always be accompanied by and tied to the Word. Now, I'm seeing exactly the same thing about this matter. But the tendency has been increasingly to regard them as more or less separate and even to feel that really they may have no connection at all. I've often discussed this with people. I remember being in an evangelistic meeting, uh, when I felt that, uh, that on that occasion the gospel had really not been preached. It had been mentioned, but it certainly hadn't been conveyed. It hadn't been preached. But to my amazement, 350 people went forward in response to the appeal at the end. And the question that I had was this, well now, what was this? And uh, I was discussing this with a man the next day, and he said, there's no difficulty about that at all, he said. He said, these results have got nothing at all to do with the preaching. I said, well, what have they got to do with? He said, this is God answering the prayers of the thousands of people who are praying for these results throughout the world. No connection with the preaching. Now, this is the, see, the, the criticism that I'm making, that there should be no disjunction like this between the appeal and the preaching any more than there should be between the sacraments and preaching. 
So I go on to make a fourth point, which is this one. This whole process, surely, carries in it the implication that sinners have inherent powers of decision and of self-conversion. It's based on that. It must be based on that. And this is something, surely, that we must reject theologically, that the sinner is completely impotent. He can do nothing. He has not got any power of decision or of self-conversion. Or I'll put it in another way, in my fifth point, there is an implication surely here that the evangelist somehow is in a position to manipulate the Holy Spirit and his work. That this activity of the evangelist is a vital element and it can make a difference to the activity of the Holy Spirit. Surely a very serious position to take up and surely an unscriptural one. So I go on to my sixth point which is this. This uh, method tends to produce a very superficial conviction of sin, if any at all. The reasons that people respond are often that they have got the impression that by doing this they are going to receive certain benefits. I remember the hearing of a man who was regarded as one of the, well he was referred to as the star convert of a campaign. And a man interviewed him and asked him as to why he had gone forward the previous year at the campaign. And his answer was that the evangelist had said that if you didn't want to miss the boat, you'd better come forward. And he said he didn't want to miss the boat, so he'd gone forward. And all the interviewer could get out of him was that he somehow now felt that he was on the boat. He wasn't clear as to what this meant, nor as to what it was, and nothing much had happened to him during the subsequent year. But there it was. It can be as superficial as that. Let me give you another illustration in my own experience. In uh, the church I was ministering in in South Wales, I, like many of you seem to do, would stand at the door, the main door of exit and entrance at the close of a service and shake hands with people as they went out. And uh, this was on a Sunday night, this particular incident, and there was a man who used to come and listen every Sunday night. He was a butcher and he was also a drinker and he used to be drunk every Saturday night regularly. But he was also seated on our gallery every Sunday night regularly. There's that type of men to be had. Well, now, this particular night, I happened to have noticed while preaching that this man was obviously being affected. I could see that he was weeping copiously, uh, and so on, and I wondered what was happening to him. Well, now, I, at the end of the service, I went and stood at the door, and I saw this man coming. And uh, immediately I went through this kind of process. Uh, shall I, in view of what I've seen, say a word to him, ask him to stay behind, or shan't I? Would I be interfering with the work of the Spirit if I do? Well, this went on, and I decided I wouldn't ask him to stay behind. So I just greeted him, as usual, and uh, he could scarcely look at me. He'd been crying so much. And... So we left it. The next night I was walking to the prayer meeting in the church and going over a little hill or a bridge he was, I found he was coming to meet, him, to meet me and he came across the road to me and said you know doctor if you'd asked me to stay behind last night I'd have done so. Well I said I'm asking you now come with me now. Oh no he said won't do it now but if you'd asked me last night I'd have done it. My dear fellow I said if what happened to you last night doesn't last 24 hours, I'm not interested in it. If you're not as ready to come with me now as you say you were last night, you haven't got the right thing. It was something temporary that influenced you. You don't see your need of Christ. But that's the kind of thing you see you get. Even without making an appeal, there it was. But when you make an appeal, you tend to exaggerate all this and to get spurious conversions. Even John Wesley, the great Arminian, even he didn't 
make these appeals for people to come forward. You see, it happened long after Wesley even. But this is what you find so often if you take the trouble to read his journals. He will say, preached at such and such a place. Many seem to be deeply affected, but God alone knows how deeply. John Wesley, the Arminian. And surely <laughs> this is very significant. He had this understanding, you see. So he didn't attach too much significance. Now he had made no appeal, but he could see they were deep, seemed to be deeply affected. What if he'd appealed on top of that? Well, there it is. You were asking for superficial results. And then another argument would be this, of course, the seventh. That um, by doing this, you are really encouraging people to think that their act of going forward somehow saves them. That this is something that's got to be done there and then, and that it is this act that really saves them, like the men who felt he was now on the boat because he had gone forward. But what does all this amount to? Well, doesn't it amount to this? Isn't it all really based ultimately on a distrust of the Holy Spirit and his power and his work? Doesn't it of necessity imply that there is a feeling that the Holy Spirit has got to be helped and aided and supplemented? That the work has to be hastened, that we can't afford to leave it in the hands of the Spirit. I can't see how you can evade coming to that conclusion. Or, to put it in another way, if you like, as a separate point, as a ninth point, doesn't it raise the whole question as to the exact belief that people who indulge in this practice really have in regeneration? This, to me, seems to be the most serious thing of all. I cannot but feel that it implies an error with regard to the whole doctrine of regeneration. What I mean is this, covering this point on the previous one, that this work being the work of the Holy Spirit and his work alone, no one else can do this. doesn't matter how gifted a man may be, what methods soever he may employ. The true work of conviction of sin and of regeneration and the giving of the gift of faith and new life is solely the work of the Holy Spirit. And as it is his work, it is always a thorough work and it is always a work that will show itself. I don't hesitate to make this, these assertions. It always has done so. You get it in the most dramatic form on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, as you get it in Acts 2, even while Peter was preaching. These men cry out under conviction, men and brethren, what shall we do? It showed itself, and it does show itself invariably. Now, I remember reading in a book, and I met the man afterwards and got it confirmed from him. I don't think I told you this. A man who'd been a missionary in the heart of Africa for 20 years. And he had, at every service, practically made great appeals to people to come forward in response to his message. And nobody had come. He'd almost broken his heart. And he would press them and plead with them. He'd do everything in the way that is familiar to us. But he couldn't get a response. Then he had to go away on one occasion to a distant part of the district of which he was in charge. And while he was away, a revival broke out in that very area. And his wife somehow got a message to him. And at first he didn't like this. I told you yesterday the preacher's greatest temptation is pride. He wasn't pleased to hear about this because it had happened when he wasn't there. Such men and women we are, let me assure you. However, he hurried back. And he was going to put all this right. He felt this was an outburst of emotionalism. Or some wild fire, strange fire. He didn't like this. He went back. And he gathered them all together into the church or the chapel, and he began to preach to them. And to his utter astonishment, he wasn't halfway through his sermon before people began coming forwards. 
What he'd failed to get them to do for 20 years, they were now doing voluntarily. Why? Well, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, had done the work. It shows itself. It's bound to show itself. This surely needs no demonstration or argument. Because it is the work of God, the Spirit, as it shows itself in nature, it's bound to show itself. And I've had most amazing experiences along this line. Uh, I want to say something sometime about the romance of the work of the preacher and the minister. And this is one aspect of it. I remember during the depths of the last war, when everything was about as discouraging as it could be, in every respect, bombing had scattered our congregation and so on, and I was really facing great discouragement. I suddenly got a letter, and I saw that it had come from uh, uh, what is now called Indonesia, Dutch East Indies, they were called then. And this was from a Dutch soldier, who said that his conscience had been pricking him, and at last had driven him to write to me, to tell me what had happened to him 18 months before, how he had come to England with the Dutch Free Army and so on, and attended our services for some time, and had been convicted of the fact that he'd never been a Christian at all, though he thought he was one, and how he then had passed through a great period uh, of conviction and trouble and trial and of hopelessness, and then had seen the truth and had been rejoicing in it ever since, but had never come to tell me about this, and was now telling me. Well, my comment, you see, is this. What's it matter whether I know or not? It matters from the standpoint of my encouragement. But it doesn't matter as regards the work. The work had been done. And the work showed itself. It had been showing itself in the man's life before he ever uh, wrote to me about it at all. And this is the thing that really matters. And thank God, this is something that I'm now experiencing having uh, retired from the pastoral charge and travelling round, and having more time and so on, I find people coming to tell me uh, that they'd been converted uh, while listening to a sermon of mine. I knew nothing at all about it years ago. I was actually in, in, in the induction service of a man uh, just about 18 months ago, and uh, he was there giving a bit of an account of his life, and to my utter amazement, I'd never known it, he told the people, he was, this man was a medical man, a doctor, and he was now giving up medicine and becoming a pastor of a church. And he just told the people how he was walking aimlessly about the streets in London on a hot June summer's evening, and heard sound of singing coming out of the chapel, and had gone in and had sat down, and he said, I went out of it a new man, born again, regenerated. He was completely ignorant of these things before, not interested, despised, and dismissed the whole thing. That was the first I'd heard of it. But it had happened in 64. What's it matter? You see, my point is that as the Spirit does the work, it is a real work, it's a solid work, and it will declare itself. Or, I'll go on and put it like this to you as a tenth point. No sinner really ever decides for Christ. That's a very wrong and a very false term. I've often heard people use a phrase like this, which has made me feel very unhappy. It's ignorance that generally makes them do it. I can think of an old man, I've heard him say this so often. He said, you know, friends, I decided for Christ 40 years ago and I've never regretted it. What a terrible thing to say. But that's the sort of thing that people say who have been brought up under this kind of regime. A sinner, I say, does not decide for Christ. The sinner flies to Christ in helplessness and in despair. Foul I to the fountain, fly. Wash me, Saviour, or I die. I don't believe any man comes truly to Christ unless he flies to him in desperation, alarm, and hopelessness in some degree. Nothing else is satisfactory. If a man can put it in those terms that he more or less has been balancing up and on the whole has decided, or if he can do so without any emotion or without any feeling, I cannot regard this as signs of regeneration. Surely, this is the position 
that a man sees himself as the chief of sinners and clutches gladly, happily at this rope that is lowered to him and which alone can save him. But then, you see, you will often be confronted by the argument of results. Look what happens, people say. This is an argument, it seems to me, that can be answered in many ways. One is, of course, that as Protestants, uh, we surely should not hold the Jesuitical doctrine of the end justifying the means. That's simply, that's all that argument really means. But I want to suggest further that you should examine the results and the claims that are made. What percentage, what percentage of these last? I've heard evangelists say that they never expect more than one-tenth to hold. They say that openly. They don't expect more than one-tenth. Well, what is it that influenced the others? And then, if the tenth are real, this is the work of the Spirit, and I say this would have happened in any case. So that is the answer to that. Not only that. To me, it's a very important thing that we should differentiate between immediate and remote results. Let's grant that you may get a number of immediate results, which are true. Grant that for the sake of argument. You still have to consider the remote effect, the general result and effect upon the life of your church and upon the life of the churches in general. And I think that if you only make this evaluation, you will have to come to the conclusion that in spite of the great figures of results reported in the last 20 years in this country and in Britain and in other countries, that nevertheless the total level of spirituality of the life of the church in general has gone deplorably down. That's the remote effect. And not only that, I find in ministers' meetings, and I attend one of some 150 men and more every month regularly, and have to talk to men in, in groups like this uh, throughout the, our own country, I find that men tell me in general that their problems have increased rather than decreased as the result of this practice. I've told you already of some men uh, who can't even get a call from certain churches because of this. I've told you of other men who are criticized by their members because they don't make this call at every service. It has introduced a new mentality, a kind of carnality, uh, an unhealthy interest in numbers, this desire for excitement almost impatience with the message because they want to see this call and the results at the end. And all this is surely very serious. And then there is another element which comes in at this point. It is a simple fact to say that the, the men who organize this kind of activity are able to predict with extraordinary accuracy the number of responses and results that they're likely to get. They will even put this in print before the campaign starts, and they're generally not very far uh, off the mark in their estimations. Now, this to me is something that is quite unthinkable in connection with the work of the Holy Spirit. You never know what the Holy Spirit is going to do. The wind bloweth where it listeth. You cannot predict, you cannot anticipate. The greatest preachers and saints have often had hard services in which nothing has happened and they've deplored it even in times of revival there have been days and meetings when nothing has happened at all and then there's been overwhelming power so th the very fact that you can more or less anticipate and, and state beforehand what is likely to happen is indicative that this is not a real work of the spirit so for these reasons i have not indulged in this practice. Well, the, what then, you may ask, should you do? I put it like this. The appeal must be in the truth itself and in the message. As you go along with your sermon, you're applying it all along the line. And especially, of course, at the end, when you come to special application and to a kind of climax. 
but the appeal is a part of the message. It should be inevitable. It should lead men to see that this is the only thing to do. And that is the way in which the appeal should be made. In the whole body of the sermon that you're preaching and in all that you're doing, I would say myself without any hesitation that a, a distinct and separate and special appeal at the end, after a break and after a hymn and so on, should only be done when one is conscious of some overwhelming injunction of the Spirit of God to do so. If ever I feel that, I do it, but it is only then, and even then, the form in which I do it is not to ask people to come forward and pander to this morbid and healthy curiosity. I just make it known that I'm ready to see them at the end of the service. Indeed, I believe that the minister should always make an announcement in some shape or form that he is available to talk to anybody who wants to talk to him about the soul and its eternal destiny. You can put it on a card in every seat as we used to do, or you can do it in any other way. Make yourself available. Let it know that you are available. And so you will find that people who have come under conviction will come and speak to you because they're unhappy. They may be afraid to go home. I've often had people who have gone halfway home and have come back again because they couldn't stand it. It was the agony was too great. Or if they've found salvation and are rejoicing in it, they'll want to come and tell you about it. They'll do it in their own time. Let them do so. Don't force these things. This is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. His work is a thorough work. It's a lasting work. And so we must not yield to this over-anxiety about results. It, I'm not saying it's dishonest. I'm saying it is mistaken. We must learn to trust the Spirit and to rely upon his infallible work. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.